Now, tonight is the 25th talk of this series and the 25th chapter of the book. And first, let me begin by saying Mahasadu to all the participating organizations, all of them, 16 Buddhist societies, had joined together in one unified stand. And that is something I am very grateful, something that I will live with great joy whenever I recall. Now, our series started six months ago on September 11th. And it started very humbly with an invitation by Subhangjaya Buddhist Association to share with me, to share with them a Dhamma topic on their usual Friday night sharing. And so I suggested, why don't I, why don't I share the first chapter of this book that was just launched on the e-version? And so we began very humbly with just one society and sharing from the very first chapter hosted by Sister Liming. And from then, we grew very rapidly with many organizations up and down the peninsula joining us. And now 16 organizations, centers share the same platform on Friday night. We are not a big community in this country, and yet we are divided into so many little centers and temples. My wish always had been, can we as one be unified? Can we as one share the beautiful Dhamma? And I'm very grateful that for the last six months, you had given me this opportunity. So tonight, is the last of this series and the topic is are you free you have the book and there are lots of it in the clang valley in the various centers that we had sent up throughout the last six months you will see this is the 25th chapter and i end this book with this chapter because ultimately the end point of all our practice and all our studies and all our investigation is freedom. And I think that is something all of us as students of the Buddha Dharma must realize. When the Buddha sent the first 60 Arahants to share the Dhamma, he said to them before they departed, Release am I, O Bhikkhus, from fetters, both human and divine. You also are free from fetters, both human and divine. Go you now, O Bhikkhus, and wonder for the gain of the many, for the good of the many, for the gain and welfare of gods and men. Now, this is an important line which we may often just overlook. The Buddha here states clearly that he is freed. A factor best illustrated in the old days with a big metal ball with a chain that is tied to one's legs. So you're literally like a slave, no freedom. Everywhere you go, this chain linked to a heavy metal ball is fettered to your feet. And the Buddha said, release am I, he's talking about himself, from fetters, from these chains, both human and divine. And he said to the 60 Arahans, you also are free from fetters, both human and divine. The ultimate goal is this beautiful freedom. The words free from fetters, both human and divine, are wonderful. Because the Buddhist teachings ultimately frees us 
from the bondages created by not only men, but even so-called divine bondages. And while you may be familiar with bondages created by men, for example, all oh, women cannot come into the temple when you are having your menstrual period. All oh, women cannot touch the Buddha image. All these are man-made bondages. No basis at all. And of course, there are even divine bondages. Oh, on this day, you must do this. Oh, you cannot eat that. Oh, you can only eat this. Oh, you must follow this commandment. Oh, you will be burning in hell if you don't do this. All these are human and divine bondages. And the Buddha Dharma ultimately, when learned, when realized, frees you. And this freedom from divine factors may in fact be an unfamiliar concept to many people. I hope you realize many people love and want to be fettered. They want divine fetters because they feel good, because they think that in exchange for that divine fetter, they will have all kinds of rewards, both material and divine. Sama Vimuti, right liberation. Right liberation is the tenth factor of the path. We are all familiar with the Eightfold Path, but many are not aware that it does not end at the Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path leads to the Ninth, which is Samayana, and that leads to the Tenth, which is Sama Vimuti. And Sama Vimuti means right liberation. You are free. The successful student of the Buddha Dharma is not only freed from mental pain, because now he understands the cause of his pain, distress, and suffering, but he is also freed to think logically and rationally with his own intellect. No longer is he enslaved by gender. In fact, the Buddha clearly instructed that women are the equal of men as far as the effort to enlightenment is concerned. And as far as most of us can see, I think the Buddhist society, centers, temples of Malaysia, half of it is held up by ladies. It is no longer, none of us should be enslaved by our caste or color, neither should any one of us be frightened into religious rites and rituals. If you are to make an offering, then understand why you make an offering. Not because you have to make an offering, but understand the lesson behind that offering. For example, if you are to offer a light, a candle, that light symbolizes the light of the Dhamma. That light is not for the Buddha. That light is for us, symbolizing that the Dhamma is the light which guides us in our daily lives. If we are to offer fruits, it is not that the Buddha is going to eat the fruit. It is purely a lesson of cause and effect that from the seed that you plant, a fruit, a consequence, a result will arise. There are no sacrifices, irrespective of whether you make an animal sacrifice or in some religions even a human sacrifice. The Buddha said that is just man's folly. Know that if you are someone learned in the Dhamma, who understand the Dhamma, you are freed not only from what I mentioned, but you are also freed from lineages and traditions 
from religions. There are no Mahayana Arahan, Theravada Arahan, or Vajrayana Arahan, or Mahasi Arahan, or Sunlun Arahan. The Arahan is simply an awakened being, simply an Arahan. That's it. He who is understanding of the Dhamma will be free to question the rationality behind everything. So I put here the Eightfold Path that we are familiar with, starting from right view or right intention, or sorry, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right stillness, samadhi. But there is a tent, which is the ultimate goal. And that tent goal is sama vimuti, or right release, or right liberation. And before that, at the ninth, sama yana, right insight, right direct knowledge. So this is taken from Mahjima Nikaya 117. Maha Chattarisaka Sutta. Do refer to it if you find what I just tell you shocking. So, ultimately, we all want to be free thinkers. Not free thinker, but free thinkers. I always welcome free thinkers into our fold. But first, I want him to be freed from whatever tied him down, and I want him to think. There is no point calling himself a free thinker when he is neither thinking nor is he freed from even his own fetters. The Buddha was a rebel 2,600 years ago. The Buddha explained to people about the futility of animal sacrifices ritual bathing, he urged the common man to use his intellect to reflect instead of blindly following tradition. Now, this is 2,600 years ago. If the Buddha today is to repeat what he said, he would still be considered a rebel. He might even be treated very badly because people do not want their beliefs to be changed. We, however, however, must use our logical mind and common sense. We must judge for ourselves. Is our action wholesome, unwholesome? From there, the consequence will arise. And not because it is dictated by a book or a teacher or any tradition. Now, we are all familiar with the Kalama Sutta. The Kalama Sutta, I see, is quoted in many centers where they will put up, do not believe in, and then a long list of things from teachers to holy books to traditions, etc. That is important, but it is not half as important as what is at the end of the Kalama Sutta. Because at the end of the Kalama Sutta, there is a paragraph whereby the Buddha tells us, after observation and analysis, when you find what is it that you have found in your holy book, in your teacher, in your culture, in your tradition, that agrees with reason and is conducive to the good and benefit of one and all then accept it and live up to it. Now, this is very important because the people of Kalamas, the Kalamas, sorry, they were confused as every teacher that went past their town, which was apparently at the crossroads, told them that only my teaching is correct. The rest is rubbish. Only my gods are right. The rest are fake. Only my tradition, my lineage, my yana, etc. is correct. 
when the Buddha passed and they heard that he was a brilliantly wise man, they made a decision. Let us ask this wise man who is finally the correct one, who is right and who is wrong. And the Buddha in his great wisdom did not condemn anyone. He did not say, throw away your culture, throw away your tradition, throw away your holy books. No, no, no. Please don't misquote the Buddha. But he said, from there, if you analyze it, if you observe it, then you will see whether it is good for one and all, you and the others. And the question you must ask, observe, analyze, and test it out. Does it agree with reason? Would it lead to harm or good? Would it lead to suffering or happiness? Will a wise person praise or disapprove? And you decide, the Buddha said. He did not condemn anyone, unlike the other teachers. He did not tell them that, oh, those are all idol worshippers. He did not tell them, I am only one who is the way, the truth. He did not say, you believe in me and all will be well. Instead, he told them to use their intelligence, use their intellect, use their judgment. This is truly a wise man. In Chinese New Year, we visit our seniors, we visit our Kayana meters, we offer tea, we serve tea, we offer gifts. None of it is religion, but it is a good culture, respect, friendship. And that we have looked at and say, yes, we should carry on with that. Qingming has passed, nothing to do with religion. It is purely in our culture. And because some man some time ago translated it as ancestor worship, we are stuck. It is actually paying respect to ancestors. Something honorable, wholesome to be praised. And yes, of course, we should continue with this tradition and not chuck it aside in the name that only my religion is correct. That would be very unwise. So brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, in this 25th talk, I beg of you, I beg of you to teach our children. And this was just something so important and close to my heart that if there is one thing I taught my children, it was this one line. Never commit intellectual suicide. Always question. Always ask, why? If someone tells you you will burn in hell, why? If someone tells you you will go to heaven if you believe in me, why? Always use your intellect. The successful student of the Buddha Dharma is a freed thinker. The Buddha urges us to use our manu, our intellect over our emotions acting calmly and rationally to achieve the best wholesome outcome. In the previous talk, I had shared how the Buddha teaches to control or still our emotions. That we do with Samatha meditation. Stilling the mind, calming the emotions, observing them, not allowing them to come and dominate our intellect. Most of the time, our decisions are dominated by our emotions. We are all emotional shoppers. We make emotional decisions. And just take a look at a football match, 22 players, one referee and two linesmen running around the field with millions around the world screaming their heads off. Completely emotion. The Buddha taught us <coughs> how to cultivate our intellect. And this we do with not only right will, right intention, but also right effort and right mindfulness. So that we had the circuit breaker 
to use our manu or intellect to make wholesome decisions. And in a time 2,600 years ago, dominated by priestly classes and religious rituals, the Buddha offered a completely different path away from superstitions, caste, faith, and magical charms. Instead, he showed us the empirical realities of life in permanence. This satisfactoriness, dukkha, and non-self, these are empirical realities of life and nature. And the way how to understand, how to make use of this, to reduce our suffering, defilements, and ultimately gain liberation. Man should not be a slave to any religion. I say it again, none of us should be a slave to any religion. Man is not for religion. Religion is for man. Whatever religion, lineage, yana, tradition you follow, that is to make us better. We are not for that religion. Religion is to make us better. So we must know how to make use of religion for our betterment and happiness. I tell my medical students when we meet over a meal, I do not care what religion you are following, I said, because to me, that is just a label. The important thing is whatever religion you claim to be following, is it making you a better person? Is it making you more full of love, compassion? Is it making you wiser? Is it making you kinder? If it is, you are following a good religion. If all you do is talk of love and compassion, but do act the opposite, and something is seriously wrong. So simply by chanting, making vows, even taking precepts, or following commandments by faith, they are useless because none of them, unless you do it with understanding, is going to make you any wiser. When you are wise, when you are awakened, when you understand, you actually do not need any religious vows. You do not need any precepts. You do not need any commandments. You do not even need faith because you know faith is a leap of faith. It is something you do not know, but you believe. You choose to believe. That is faith. That is not what the Buddha wants. Sada does not refer to that. Sada is confidence. You know because you have experienced it directly. You know it is impermanent. You know it is dukkha. You know it is non-self. You know that keeping the precepts is good for you and for others. It is a harmonious way of life. It is the way that we can make our society, our family better. And when you know there is no faith, there is no coercion, there is no commandment. So the Buddha Dharma has zero commandments. When you follow the precepts as we recited just now, we do it not because it is a commandment, but because we want to do it. Sikha Padam, a training that we choose to follow. So when one knows there is no need to have faith, and Buddhism is not what most people think. Most people think of Buddhism as going to Subang Jaya, Medical, uh, Subang Jaya Center Main Hall and prostrating to the Buddha image. That is not Buddhism. Whether you prostrate to the Buddha image or do not prostrate to the Buddha image makes absolutely no difference. If you wish to prostrate out of respect, humility, 100 marks. If you prostrate 
because you think the Buddha is going to bless you with some miracle, miraculous return, then you are far off the track. When we understand life, and that understanding is basically Dhamma, nature. Even death is not to be feared. Because as shared before, there is no death. There is continuation. It is not that Buddhists believe in rebirth. No. There is nothing to believe. Because we know that there is in reality no death. And even the Chinese word for death, Wang Shen, reflects that understanding. You are actually in transit to another birth. Wang Shen. Freedom is the ultimate goal. And that's why it is ultimately finding freedom beyond all beliefs. So as human beings, Please, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, use our ability. Manu, so beloved because of the first verse and second verse in the Dhammapada, where it, refer, where it refers to Manu. And often we quote that it is mind that is foremost, mind that is chief from the verses there. But that word in Pali is Manu. And Manu is actually not mind. Manu is one aspect of mind. Manu refers to the intellectual aspect. It is your intellectual aspect that makes decisions or fail to make decisions that acts through body, speech, and mind. And the same word is found in the word Manusia in Malay that tells you that you have this ability of manu to think logically. So let us, brothers and sisters, make full use of this faculty, teach ourselves, teach our children never to commit intellectual suicide. The problem is some people are so lazy that they prefer to commit intellectual suicide and just accept based on fate, lead of fate, blind fate. So our thinking process, whether it is based on greed, anger, and delusion, or the opposite, non-greed, non-anger, non-ignorance, or non-delusion, will arise our actions. And these will lead to outcomes, either happy or unhappy, wholesome or unwholesome. And the Buddha wants all of us to develop our faculty, evolve this faculty to its highest state, not surrendering to selfish emotions or knee-jerk reactions, but to learn to calm the emotions with samatha, and to train your manu to act mindfully, responsibly, and wholesomely. So we want the states of metta karuna instead of greed, anger, and delusion. Do not, brothers and sisters, be mistaken. When I say still the emotions, some get mistaken and say, oh, everything still, even good things also still. No, when you understand the Dhamma, your natural state of mind is one of metta, karuna, loving kindness and compassion. When your ego is seen to be a delusion, when you have conquered your ego, when you have seen that we are all interconnected, your natural state is one that you will act with metta karuna. And why not? When you see that not only is your neighbor and your family, you, an extension of you, even society is an extension of you. So always remember 
Dhamma family, Metta is a verb. Haruna is a verb. They are acted on, not merely spoken or praised or mentioned or chanted. I always thank in my mind Brother Joseph because Brother Joseph constantly reminds us where is the matter? In all that we do, Brother Joseph will remind us where is the matter? And then we reflect and make sure that our actions are based on metta karuna. So Buddhism does not offer us anything which is superstitious or miraculous or dreams of a heavenly future. He doesn't tell you, oh, believe in the Buddha and you go to heaven. Believe in the Buddha and all your sins are forgiven. Believe in the Buddha and whatever you dana will come back ten, hundred, thousand fold. One dollar dana, one thousand dollars return. No, no, no. The Buddha tells us reality, not patronizing or claims that are unrealistic. So while the pessimist complains about the wind, and the optimists expect the wind to change. If you are a good Buddhist, what you do is you adjust the sail. You do not complain about the wind because the wind is merely nature. And you do not pray for the wind to stop or to go in the correct direction. But you adjust the sail. And that is what for far is about. It is realistic. And whenever you are mindful, Whenever your emotions are still and calm and you are able to use your manu to make wholesome decisions, congratulations, your Buddha mode is on. Your Buddha nature is awake. Let us try and keep it that way most, if not all the time. For the Arahant, his mind is always in this mode. For us, we switch on and off a thousand times a day between a wholesome mood and a mood pushed by our greed or our emotions or our ego. So we are all familiar with the sutta in which the Buddha spoke about the eight winds. Gain, loss, status, disgrace, censure, praise, pleasure, and pain. And the Buddha clearly taught us in this particular sutta that if you have a well-trained mind, it is still amidst these eight emotional winds. Sama samadhi in Pali. Right? Stillness, not concentration, but stillness in English, and in Chinese, zhen, ding. I think the Chinese translation is probably the most accurate because that translation is done by practicing monks and not by academicians. Zhen, ding. Is your mind still amidst the emotional turmoil, the waves of gain and loss, status and disgrace, censure and praise, leisure and pain. If you are fully awakened, your mind will be calm and just resting in metta karuna. For us, we train our minds with meditation, with stillness, with mindfulness, so that we at least try not to let our emotions drive us up and down the roller coaster. Knowing this, the wise person mindful ponders these changing conditions. Desirable things don't charm the mind. Undesirable things bring no resistance. A student of the Buddha Dharma is like water flowing through rocks. It flows with the path of least resistance. 
four fa or dhamma in Chinese. Fa, three dots of water and chu going out. Like water flowing out. We flow with the least resistance, not allowing the ups and downs of life to create dukkha. Absolute freedom comes when Saka asks, in brief, how is the bhikkhu liberated in the destruction of craving? And the Buddha replies, a bhikkhu who has heard that nothing is worth clinging to as me, I, or mine. He directly knows all things. And this is in Ajima Nikaya, the 37th discourse. Now this phrase has been paraphrased into Sabbe Dhamma Nalam Abhinive Saya. Sabbe Dhamma, small d. Small d means phenomena. Sabbe is all things, all phenomena, all things. Nalam should not be Abhinive Saya clung to. Nothing whatsoever should be clung to. We must learn to let go. We must learn to think, not, oh, what has he got for me? What is in there for me? And I say this recently with great passion because so many people have come and said, oh, the COVID-19 vaccine, should I get it, Dr. Wong? And if I get it, what will happen to me? What will happen? Will I have fever? Will I have pain? And I keep on saying this so many times. The COVID vaccine, Sister Li Ming, Sister Joanne, brothers and sisters, is not for you. If you are thinking what will happen to me, then there will be endless thinking because you are thinking with a big self in the equation. The COVID-19 vaccine, I repeat, is not for you, but for the people whom you love, for your family, for your young ones, old ones, parents, uncles, for your workplace, for your society, for Subang Jaya, for Subang Jaya Buddhist Center, for all of Malaysia. You are vaccinating for the goodness of your society, your family, your nation. It is to save your country's economy. So one of the things I learned is that whenever we put the big I in any decision, then greed, ego comes in. If you make decisions based not on I, but on everyone, on Meta, on Karuna, then you will understand why you must go for the COVID-19 vaccine. Because if not, you die, I die, everyone dies. So I use this as an example. Please, we are doing it not for self, but for everyone. Nothing whatsoever should be clung to. Nothing whatsoever should be clung to. When you understand the interconnectedness of everyone, you will understand that we have no boundaries. Then you will be free. And then you will act with Metta Karuna. The problem now is whenever people act, they question, what is it in there for me? That is the sad tragedy of selfish human. Now, there are many lessons I have shared in this journey last six months from Chan. And tonight, I want to share two particular ones which is related to this. Are you free? First lesson, a horrible, horrible insult. Su Tong Po, as you know, was part of the Chinese literati. 
he went into the Buddha Dharma to seek liberation. And he was very blessed that the Chan Master Fo Yin became a friend and a teacher. And they frequently exchanged views. And one day, Su Tung Po and the Chan Master Fo Yin sat in meditation opposite each other. When they came out of the meditation, Su Tung Po asked Venerable Fo Yin, What do you think I see? When I see you in meditation. And the Venerable said, What? Please tell. And Sutung Po said, You look like a pile of shit. Can you imagine how insulting that is? A pile of shit. Itwe Najis. Venerable Foyin smiled serenely, places two palms together in salutation. The Venerable has a well-trained mind, freed of the eight winds, freed of emotional turmoil, freed from the sways of insults and praises. Su Tung Po then asked Venerable Foyin a second question. What do you think I look like when you see me in meditation. Without a moment's hesitation, the Chan Master Foyin said, You look like an exalted Buddha. How Xiang Fo? And Su Tung Po was full of pride on hearing that, elated in his victory. On going home, he told his sister, I finally won this time. The Chan Master Fo Yin lost to me. Sister, an intelligent girl, said to him, Brother, you lost very badly today. In the mind of the Chan Master, all sentient beings are regarded with respect, love, and compassion. In his mind, he sees the wholesome, good, and noble in all beings. That is why he sees you as a Buddha. Your mind is corrupt and unclean. That is why you see Venerable Fo Yin as a pile of shit. You have exposed your character and mind. Brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, I hope from this story you have seen how much freedom you can get when you truly understand when you truly apply the Buddha's teachings. You only see the good. You only see amidst such a horrendous insult, only a Buddha. The Chan Master lived happily in the moment, reflecting good, wholesome. In South's allegations, backstabbing flows off like water on the lotus petal. On the other hand, Su, with his big ego, selfish, proud, and petty, wanting praises and erupting insults liberally. Through a beautiful heart, everything is beautiful. Remember, we are taught to know reality, to see reality. But yet, as we go further, we also realize anatta, non-self. We realize the illusion of separateness and we see the interconnectedness of everything. Metta karuna will become the emotional state that is of such an awakened being. So what is important is inner happiness, not the outer facade. And the things that people say is a mirror of their heart or a mirror of their mind. Now, while it is very unlikely today that you are going to be called a pile of shit at work, at school, at home, even at many places, including centers, Sometimes hurtful words fly, and they can stab us like knife in the back 
as illustrated in this cartoon. Su Tongpo called such a respected master a pile of shit. I think that is probably one of the most ultimate insults. Today, one may similarly be called, in much milder terms, ignorant, deviant. Oh, he knows nothing. Oh, he doesn't know how to teach. Or maybe even, oh, he's a mara. Such words mirroring the inner turmoil of the accuser. Like Su Tung Po, help is needed to be freed from evil. And the well-trained student of the Buddha Dharma should be unmoved by these eight winds. For he is freed. So all things arise because of causes and conditions. When we understand this, we will understand much better. All things are empty of any inherent existence. Even if a brother is called stupid, don't know anything, whatever state, does this object exist all the time? Was there a point in time where it didn't exist? Maybe he was praised, in fact. And if there is, how did it come into existence? For the object to come into existence, surely there were conditions which led to it. And are these conditions persistent? Do they last forever? And the simple answer is no. If conditions cease to exist, will the object continue to exist? No, conditions change rapidly. Even an object of ridicule may become an object of praise tomorrow. So we understand that these words that may sound harsh are empty of any inherent existence. And everything being permanent, all of us change. Emotions change. Anger changes. All things will pass. When we can understand that we are never ever the same, that we are always changing, when you understand this, you understand anatta. You are freed. The first noble truth is that pain, that hurt, those words, which will affect all of us. It's called the first noble truth because inevitably all of us will be affected. Here I want to point out my gratitude to Sister Siu Yin in Singapore, who waded through much difficulties and help me with the making of the Breaking Myths book. Much of the Chinese words, translations that I use were all her hard work. And the two hours worked through many, many late nights together with my medical students, getting that book last year out for print. Here, I wish to record my gratitude for her help. Second lesson I want to share, now a most horrible accusation. And of course, if we live in such a way that is so wholesome, that even if someone is to speak badly of us, no one may believe it or would believe it. And this story is of Hakuin and the baby. And from this, you will truly learn what freedom meant when someone understands the Buddha Dharma. So he was a very morally upright Zen master, and a beautiful unmarried girl became pregnant with child in the village. Naturally, the parents were furious. They wanted to know the father, but the girl would not give them the name. After some time, repeated scolding, pestering, the girl said, it was the master, the Zen master. Of course, the parents were furiously furious. He went to the master, scolded him viciously, and left the newborn with him. And all the master said was, is that so? He took care of the baby with whatever he had. His reputation now scattered, shattered. And he was an object of mockery where once he was a person highly respected. 
The young girl was tortured by her conscience and she finally disclosed that the child's real father is a man who worked in the market. The parents again flew into a rage. They came running to the master, begged his forgiveness and took the child back. And all the master said, is that so? This is truly a man who has understood non-self or anatta, truly a man with no ego. And from this story, we learn equanimity. Inner peace comes when we respond to success, failure, praise and blame in the way the Buddha taught us. The eight winds are looked at with a still mind. And the master did not allow this unexpected event to disturb his inner peace and happiness. Acceptance. Many things in life we cannot control. Whatever life throws at us, we need to accept whatever we cannot change. The only thing we can change and the only thing we are responsible for is how we react and our attitude. Character. Our character depends on how we respond to difficult situations. And this second story illustrates a most difficult situation. Judging others, the parents and the people in the village should avoid jumping to conclusions. Sometimes we judge too rapidly. And of course, the girl's conscience, and of course, our language. The parents, understandably, were furious. They would have spoken with anger and rage. But we can also speak peacefully. We who are students of the Buddha Dharma must learn to steal the eight winds. We must have a paradigm shift in our thinking and our attitude. Life is as it is. It's nature. We have to adapt ourselves to life's changing vestitudes. And I've shared the story of Bring Me the Rhinoceros so many times. One of the most beautiful Chan stories that teaches us such a profound lesson. Even amidst the worst outcome, we can be having inner calmness and happiness as long as we understand. And the Chan master, the Zen master Dogen puts it so well. A flower falls, he said, even though we love the flower. A weed grows, even though we do not love it. I hope, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, you understand this very profound statement. A flower falls, even though we love it. And the weed grows, even though we do not love it. This Dhamma family is life. This Dhamma family is reality. It is how we adapt to this reality that will determine our happiness. The right speech was something shared by my Dhamma family in JB just one or two weeks ago when they spoke of pleasant speech in the Mangala Sutta. Once the word comes out, we cannot retract it. And today, it is not just the spoken word. Today, our words are texted, emailed, posted, and some even goes viral, reaching places and people that you will never imagine will reach. During the seventh month last year, I wrote a short article about how overseas Chinese develop a special relationship to this Festival of the Hungry Bulls. A little bit modified from that which is seen in China because of the unique status of people who have migrated here in the 1800s and died alone, without descendant, without relatives, 
and how today the people who survive like us will make offerings to the hungry ghost, respecting the people who came with our ancestors. That short article I wrote came back to me via my sister-in-law from Germany. And similarly, friends in Singapore sent me back that article through mails and texts that they receive from overseas. So it is even more crucial than my family that we respect this auspicious blessing in the Mangala Sutta called pleasant speech and this step in the Noble Eightfold Path called right speech because once we had done opposite, then its consequences can literally reverberate for a long, long time. Otherwise, if we have done it well, then the good things too will be there for a long, long time. We need Kayana meters, Dhamma family. All of us here, 300 plus listening live and about 4,000 total viewing via Facebook. We are all Kayana meters. We support each other. We are a treasure to each other. We are a comfort when a friend is in need or hurt, or we celebrate together when there is happiness and we are the strength to each other's activities. We laugh at the same stupid things. We look and give each other honest advice and we remain good friends no matter where we are. Kayana meters or noble spiritual friends are so important in the spiritual journey. Basically, all of us have two basic wishes, to be free from suffering problems, to be happy all the time. And I had shared in the last six months, the Buddha's life skills teaching us how to achieve these. Now, one of the greatest freedom that we learn from the Buddha Dharma is that even our own thoughts is not us. Even thoughts which arise, we are free from that as long as you do not act on it. Being aware of the sound of the bell, does that mean that the bell belongs to you? Likewise, being aware of thoughts, does it mean the thoughts belong to us? It only belongs to us when we had chosen to act on it, then it becomes karma. So our protection is our Dhamma, our understanding of the Dhamma and our living our lives guided by the Dhamma. And in the Theragatha, it is clearly taught to us the Dhamma protects those who live by the Dhamma. This is important. And our deeds, they are like a drop of water. You might see it as minuscule, but even a drop of water falling into the vast ocean will never evaporate until the ocean does. Just so merit, fully dedicated towards enlightenment, not towards you making money or having a bigger house or a better car, but dedicated towards wholesomeness will never vanish before enlightenment is reached. Dhamma family, I have shared with you for six months, there are three types of wisdom. One is the intellectual wisdom, which we understand by our understanding purely based on reasoning. This is called intellectual wisdom, literal wisdom. Another one, is reflective wisdom as we all reflect in our daily lives. Is the Buddha Dharma correct? Are things impermanent? Are things non-self? Does the Four, four Noble Truth tell us what life is? Is it truly Dukkha? Etc. Etc. But the ultimate is the understanding of reality 
this is a direct insight into how things truly are. Even the Four Noble Truths, you know, has 12 aspects. The first aspect, the intellectual understanding. And the second aspect, the understanding through our doing, our reflection, and finally, ultimate reality. That means we know through insight, yana, that truly the Four Noble Truths, the three universal characteristics is correct. And the way to do it is through the Eightfold Path, which we live every day, finally leading us to Samayana, ultimate reality, wisdom, and Sama Vimuti, right liberation. Now, the point of spiritual practice is not to escape, but to live our lives fully, to be used in daily life. Happiness cannot be earned, worn, own, consumed. The Buddha's teachings are like cooked rice in a pot. If you just keep the teachings in the pot without eating, what good is that? So you need to eat that rice. And yes, in reality, the only people we can change is ultimately ourselves. Can we change other people, even our own children? With great difficulty. The world, near impossible. Maybe a few. But we can certainly help like-minded Buddhists, Kayana meters, to be better Buddhists. The Dhamma is experiential. There is no God with a capital G. There is no personal God. There is no one for you to bribe. And certainly, there are no dogmas. Everything can be challenged, questioned, and debated. And Albert Einstein, this most brilliant of men, in fact said that if there is one religion which will fit, it is only Buddhism. So brothers and sisters, the Buddha, our teacher, is our G-O-D. But our G-O-D here is not the God that other people think of in other religions. Here, our G-O-D is the one who gives us the gift of Dhamma. There is nothing to believe, everything to know. And Buddhism, in fact, has been called the godless religion. God in Buddhism is not a noun, not a personality. So while it is very old, 2,600 years, it is yet very new because I'm a deeply religious non-believer. There's nothing to believe. It's everything to know. And this aspect is something which will shock many, many people even today. Now we have ended 25 sharings. May the merit of these sharings serve to nourish the seeds and roots of wisdom and happiness of every one of you here. May the merits of this practice serve to dissolve all the causes of suffering. I record in gratitude, the book was actually proposed by Didi Huatai when he came to JB and we had dinner. And he actually proposed to me, why don't Dr. Wong, you compile all your writings on the internet into another book? And Brother Ju Singh, to his credit, organized all the various centers into a common platform. Sadhu to them. And I want to thank all the MCs of the various societies, all the moderators, who had done their best to make every session interesting, enlightening, happy, etc. You can see all of them smiling so beautifully. And finally, not lastly, finally, many people are not aware of a very hard-working IT team 
this team works very hard behind the scene and they have to be there all the time with every one of our sharings. And I often ask for breaks because I feel the IT team should have breaks because if not, every week they have to work very, very hard managing the internet and the cross postings and some use different platforms, all that they sort out wonderfully. To them, my heartfelt appreciation. I want to ask you a final question. After six months of sharing, ask yourself, has the Buddha Dharma set us free? Has it made you liberated? Or are you still bound by rituals and traditions? Ask yourself, religion has it served me well? Has it made me a better person? Finally, Mahasadhu to every one of you, watching on Friday night or watching on Facebook. Thank you. In sharing with you, I have learned more than I have taught. We will not disappoint 4,000 people every week in May, starting on a proposed date of 28 May. We will start off the new series based on an earlier book of mine called Walking in the Buddha's Footprints. I have given the link and the various societies have put up the link whereby you can download this book free. This series starting in May will not be every Friday because I think it's too tiring for the IT team, but we will try to make it at least twice a month. So to know when, just like Meta Buddhist Fellowship Facebook page. Just go to Facebook, search for Meta Buddhist Fellowship and like it. And then you will be updated whenever we have talks. With that, I come to the conclusion of this series of talks. I wish to thank everyone, the organizers, and in particular, I want to thank Subhangjaya Buddhist Association for starting off the entire series on September 11, with just a humble Friday evening sharing, principally at that time, to Subhangjaya Buddhist Society. Instead, now we have grown not only na nationwide, but internationally. To all the people watching in from Indonesia, Singapore, Australia, Canada, UK, and elsewhere, thank you for giving me your time. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, 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 to our speaker, Dr. Puna Wong, for tonight's Dharma sharing, are you free? We are free and we shall be very happy tonight. Definitely very interesting as we are having many questions. Wow. Quickly, I'll go to the first question. It's question time now. Shall we pose the first question? Here we go. Let's see the first, the first question. All right, first question. After following and listening to all the 25 series of Breaking Myths, will we be free or will we be only free and liberated after listening to all and following the Buddha's footstep, the first book of the third Buddha. Brother Leong, good evening. It's always good to see you, Brother Leong, on our Friday evening talks. If you have the opportunity, the conditions, even one talk by anyone, not me, but anyone, with regards to the Buddha Dharma, and you will be free. The venerable Kondana was not even a venerable. He was an ascetic when he listened to the Buddha gave, give the Dhamma Chaka Pavatana Sutta. At the end of the Dhamma Chaka Pavatana Sutta, which spoke of the middle way, the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, Kondana became 
the first Sotapan. And that was why he was renamed Anya Kondana. And he only became a monk later. So, no, it does not mean you have to faithfully follow a syllabus like a schoolboy going through a primary education. These talks merely are bridges to help us cross rivers. And any one of those rivers could be the river that you need to set you free to be liberated. So, of course, I would like you to follow all my talks. It's a lot of work to prepare for every sharing, I can tell you that. But no, it don't have to be the entire thing that I'm sharing. Look, I've shared in Johor Bahru for almost 15 years. And the fact that I'm still sharing means I'm not a very good teacher because if not, all of them should be Arahans. So the fact that they are not means I'm actually not a very good teacher. So rather you may please do join us, of course, but remember you don't need to say, oh, this is a syllabus I must follow all. No, even one talk with a condition and you can be free. You can attain Sama Vimuti. All right? All right, good. Thank you very much. Let's go for the second question. There's just many questions today. Ah, from Saramban, Sudama, Sister Christy Lee. He's believing in Feng Shui, a type of defilement. Well, Sister, first, I would say a belief in Feng Shui or a belief in so many things is very much a part of our Chinese culture. Of course, do not be too attached. Much of Feng Shui is common sense. I mean, a lot of it is common sense. I mean, if you have a house facing a road junction, of course, you're going to have a higher chance of a car knocking into your house or knocking into your fence or something like that. That's actually common sense. And if you've got a big tree blocking your main entrance, I doubt anyone would want to buy your house for the simple reason is simply not very practical. So Feng Shui is something evolved in our Chinese culture. And a lot of it is useful tips that you can actually apply to make your house more pleasant, but certainly do not be attached. Remember, sabe, dhamma, all things. Sabe, dhamma means all phenomena. Dhamma, small d, is phenomena. All phenomena must not be attached to, clung to, not let go. So, yeah, you can always use whatever you like in feng shui, but you do not attach to it such that if you go against it, oh, I'm going to die already, I went against it. No, 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 that would be very foolish. But you can certainly apply its principles, some of which are pretty good principles, I must say. You know, who wants to have a water pipe running on top of your head in your bedroom, isn't it? I mean, that's common sense. You wouldn't want that. So these are common sense things that evolved with Chinese culture that I think you can apply. But certainly do not cling unto it until you become another one more attachment to your credit all right we are trying to lessen our attachments not have more and more thank you well that that was a very good answer oh a lot of common sense all right let's go for the next question brother okay what is the best way to cultivate ourselves in order to be free from the eight winds of change all right i do not have the name of was so i can't address you directly but let me say it again that our training is still on the foundation of dana sila and bhavana dana is a way of training us to let go and i've shared with you the story of the emperor Lianguti, who did lots of dana but he wanted praise he needed people to say, oh, Kung Te Wu Liang, ah. wow, Wang Shang, Kung Te Wu Liang. Ah. So because of that, he got rebuked by Bodhidharma, who told him no merits whatsoever. So you have to remember that our practice begins with dana. We learn to let go. Right? <clears throat> and of course, dana parami is dana done without any expectation of return. Not even people praising you not even people saying, oh, such a generous man, or why oh, I need to give you this gold medal or whatever. So that is one of the ways we all begin with dana, not just of 
material things, part of time, but Chuan spends time doing this. My IT people here spend so much time every week doing this. They don't receive any praises. Nobody even know about them. So that's one. They're already learning that their mind can be happy without praise, without people saying, wow, such a good IT. Nobody ever say such a good IT. That's one thing. Then the next one is sila. All right. And I say we keep our sila not because of a commandment, but because we want to, because we know it is good. And sila includes things like do not harm things, do not steal things, do not have horrible speech, all of which I had mentioned. Now, when you do not have horrible speech, you already contributed, you're already contributing a lot to this, towards these winds. You know, in Si Wuji, Si Yuji, you know, the new Mo Wang, the wife has a big fan. That big fan and she blow can cause a tsunami. And in that story, where is that fan kept? Where is the wife of Liu Mo Wang's huge fan that can cross a tsunami kept? It is kept in her tongue, in her mouth. Si Yu Chi, written a thousand years after Xuan Jiang passed away, is actually a Buddhist novel based on Buddhist principles. It's a very nice book with a lot of moral lessons. Why is that fan kept in the tongue? Because when she takes out that fan from her tongue and she does boom, it causes a huge tsunami. That is the biggest wind from just speech. Speech itself creates a tsunami. And of course, when we contribute to pleasant speech as stated in the Mangala Sutta, right speech in the Eightfold Path, we are not only helping our society, our family have karma environment, we are also training ourselves to have karma environment. And the next one, of course, is Bhavana. Yes, you have to learn meditation. You have to learn to calm. And I think Samatha meditation, be it simply just doing Buddha, Buddha, Buddha on the, on the beats or just doing your breathing in, breathing out on the beats. It's a very simple and effective way of calming our minds down. Because when you do that regularly, your mind naturally goes to that state instead of immediately reacting when you are faced with something. All right. Now, I hope you realize that in Chinese, when the person says that he has this state where he's not affected by the eight winds, that means he's telling you he's enlightened. All right. So if someone, if Brother Chuan tells me, Brother Chuan is literally telling me he's enlightened. That means his mind, so calm, so mindful, that none of these will affect him. Thank you. Right, after you have uh, explained to us, I would like to follow up a question. If a highly learned person like Su Dong Po, right, was not free from the eight winds of fetters, is it very difficult for an ordinary people to be free from such bondages? Well, highly learned doesn't mean a person who is very wise in the Dhamma. There are lots and lots and lots of highly learned people. Lots of them. One university in Malaysia I read just a few weeks ago produced don't know how many hundred PhDs. So in theory, we have lots and lots of highly learned people. But are they wise is another matter. Do they have right view is another matter. Do they have right intention is another matter. Su Tung Po, yes, literati. But he certainly did not have right view. And neither was their right intention. If you look at the many, many stories in Chan that revolve around Su Tung Po, you will see that basically he was a very egoistic, proud man who loves to be praised, who wants things his way. He certainly didn't have the first two factor, uh, the first two factors of the Eightfold Path. So highly learned doesn't mean you have right will and right intention. On the other hand, someone who may not be highly learned may have right views and right intentions. And, you know, the rest comes from right view and right intention. That's why you have right view, right intention. With right view and right intention, you will have right speech. 
your speech will follow. You will have right action and you will have right livelihood. Because if you have right will and right intention, you certainly would not engage in a likelihood that is considered inappropriate. So right view, right intention is very, very important part as we start this journey. So yes, Su Tung Po is highly learned, but not necessary is he wise in right view or right intention. So even someone who does not have the kind of formal education, you don't have to have a PhD that stands for permanent hate damage as far as we are concerned. You do not need that to have wisdom. All right, some people with great wisdom may have very little formal education. All right, let me put it this way. Every time I drive with my wife, and then we see how some people behave, you know, pew, 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 or, you know, okay, let me put it this way. You go to KL, people double park, triple park. They do not give any thought as to how much trouble they are creating, how narrow they have made the road. They just park there and go eat their chop suit or whatever and can. And I will tell my wife, in Malaysia, we have very literated people. We all gone to school. Many people gone to college, university. But we have very few educated people. Mm. Because someone who is educated will not behave in this way. So I hope that illustrates the point that I'm sharing with you here. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, we have a question from uh, Putra Heist. Oh, nothing whatsoever should be clung to. What about a Dharma? Is it possible for people to cling to the Dharma? What are the, some examples of clinging to the Dharma and how do we overcome this? Well, Brother Ko, there's a very nice sutta, very profound sutta called The Wrong Way of Grasping a Snake. There are even books written on that sutta. And it is in this sutta, which I would suggest that any serious student of the Dhamma should read, that the Buddha talked about crossing from this side to the other side across this river. We are all familiar with that expression, how we cross from this side to the other side. And how the Buddha used this raft that we are using to cross as an illustration for the Dhamma. And the Buddha said, the Dhamma that you learn is like the raft that helps you to cross from this side to the other shore. And then in this sutta, the Buddha asked, if you reach the other shore, tell me, he asked the bhikkhus, are you going to carry that raft or are you going to let go of that raft at the edge of the river or the shore and proceed? And of course, all they said was, oh, yes, of course, it is logical that you will let go and then you proceed. And the Buddha made that statement. It is not just a dhamma that you let go. Even the dhamma you let go. You do not cling to it because, you see, the word dhamma, very often when we put it that way, people think of it as something exotic, you know, wow, something from the sky or like a meteorite that came down. No, dhamma is merely the way nature works the way science, the way our lives are, the way the human mind works. It is not something which fell down from the sky like a meteorite. So this understanding of the Dhamma is what helps us cross the shore from suffering, from greed, hatred, delusion, to the other shore of non-greed, non-hatred, delusion. Now you have wisdom. Now you're no longer deluded. And when you reach the other shore, you do not need to cling on to even the Dhamma because the Buddha said, Adhamma, the opposite, you let go. Even the Dhamma, you let go. So remember, all that we teach is a means. And some people are very, very attached to the means. Some people are very attached to my lineage, my teacher's teaching. You know, I had someone who wrote to me just last week. People in this society not even allowed to listen to any other teaching. They can only listen to the teaching of their teachers, their lineages. Not even beyond their lineage, beyond their tradition. So I cannot think 
of a better way of illustrating what Brother Wen Ken here is asking. People are very attached to my Dhamma, my teacher's interpretation of the Dhamma, not realizing that, as I said, there is no Mahayana Arahan. There is no Theravada Arahan. There is no Vajrayana Arahan. There is no Mahasi Arahan or Pa'au Arahan or Sun Lun Arahan. There is only the Arahan. There is only the enlightened being, not a Mahasi enlightened being. There is only this Dhamma to help us cross. Do not cling onto it as though it is an object. That's why in that sutta, it is literally translated as the wrong way to handle a snake. Because if you handle it wrongly, you're going to get bitten. All right? Thank you. All right. Thank you. We, uh, we, we have the next question. Uh, very, oh, from, from Brother Koho again. All oh, right. In order to free ourselves from defilement, we have to walk the noble path and seek liberation. But because of our ignorance, we do not see the value of liberation and value of the path. So we need to seek liberation in order to be free from defilement. But because of our defilements, we do not even want to walk the path. How do we begin? Well, <laughs> Brother Wenken, again, why do you think we are still here 2,600 years after the Buddha had passed away? The fact that you and I are still here 2,600 years after the Buddha preached and shared with us the Dhamma literally means that you and I are caught in this very vicious cycle. And now, remember, the Buddha said that there are only very few people with little dust in their eyes. In Chinese, we say, Hong Chen, red dust. Now, you've been to a pilgrimage to India, you will really understand what the Buddha meant. As soon as the bus moves, literally, it's a cloud of red dust. Or a lorry in front, habis, a cloud of red dust. So there are very few people with little dust in their eyes. There are very few people who want to walk this way because it is against the grain of greed, of lust. Most people would want the sensual gratification, immediate. Very few people have that wisdom to say, I do not want to walk the path of sensual gratification. So, this question which you ask is not a philosophical question. It is a reality. There are very few people who want to be awakened, who want to be enlightened. Even among our brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, if you ask everyone, do you want to be awakened in this life? Do you want to be awakened in this life? To be honest, there are actually very few people who will answer yes. And Ajahn Brahm illustrated it so well. When he was in JB, one of the sisters, not my wife, but another sister, raised her hand and said, Ajahn, can I be enlightened in this life? She asked. Ajahn Brahm looked at her and said, Sister, your question is wrong. Your question should be, do I want to be enlightened in this life? And the reality the honest answer is no. The vast majority of you here, the answer is no. And I then went on to explain, if you tell me that you really want to be enlightened in this life, he said, you go home now, you see a note stuck on the door, and your husband has written a note that says, dear wife, I have run off with the maid because I think she can give me a happier life. I am so sorry, but I'm leaving you. If you tell me, he said, you really want to be enlightened in this life, you will write back to your husband and say, I am so happy for you that you have found someone who will make you happier. Go with my full blessings. Now you have understood letting go. You have understood what it takes to really not be attached. And then you are ready. You are the one person in this hall who wants to be enlightened in this life. The vast majority, they do not want. They want to learn some Dhamma, they want to do good, they want to have good returns, but effectively they say, oh, yeah, not ready yet, lah. maybe next life, lah. because we are so attached to our sensual gratifications. 
We are so attached to all the good things that we are enjoying. And that's why the Buddha said this generation is not one that will want to seek the Dhamma. Because this generation is a generation that wants sensual gratification. Remember, uh, brothers and sisters, the third precept, Kamesu Michachara, the word K-A-M-A is not sex. Uh, the word K-A-M-A is sensual. Kama Sutra is one aspect of it. So the third precept actually refers to sensual, micha, wrong, sensual gratification. All right, micha is wrong. Eh? Wrong, sensual gratification. So it's micha chara, wrong. Kamesu, micha chara. K-A-M-A. Micha, wrong. Chara like in Malay. Way. The journey, the trip. Wrong sensual gratification of which sexual gratification is one of them. Now, most of us have so much good things that we enjoy from our whatever that you enjoy that maybe is an audio game, video game, whatever, that we actually do not want to let go. We want to continue enjoying. So I hope this illustration can help you understand why you are saying we are caught in this cycle. All right? Thank you. All right, good. We have so many questions. I have to say, all right, not to disappoint, disappoint the last question. I, I can only accept one last question. All right. Uh, from uh, Mr. Sandra Tang, I have a question, all right? How do we reconcile with the notion of not clinging onto existence, that consciousness is not our self, and that this body is not our self? After accepting this, what will life be like? How do we understand? Suyata Anatta. This is the only way via meditation. All right, Sister Sandra. I hope my explanation now will help you a little bit. If it has helped you, then I think we have ended the 25 talks well. The first thing I think you have to be sure and not misunderstand is that the Buddha never said that you do not exist. That is a misinterpretation of anatta. Again, bringing you to illust an illustration, when Bodhidharma was in China, one of the monks he met, she chatted with him, and this monk tried to show him his understanding of the Dhamma. And this monk said, chie chie kong. Then he recited all the five khandas, everything kong, all is kong. He said, everything is empty, no existence. Bodhidharma looked at him, took his face and knocked his head. Then he said, ow, so painful. Why did you knock my head? And Bodhidharma said, you just told me everything is kong. You just told me your body kong, your feeling kong, everything kong. So, who is feeling the pain? And then Bodhidharma turned and walked away. And this monk actually had a realization. So, this is a common misunderstanding, Sister Sandra. The Buddha did not say that Sister Sandra time does not exist. No, the Buddha did not say that. Remember, the Buddha was in a culture which believed in an Atta. A T T A. And Atta refers to something concrete, something indestructible, something that you can burn in hell for a thousand years or go to heaven for a million years. And it is indestructible. And then this something concrete reincarnates. From body, die, then come out, go, next body, then after that die, then come out, then go, next body. That is what the culture at that time believed in until this Atta joins with Brahma. The Buddha, when he meditated, when he looked, he realized this is wrong. There is no unchanging, permanent, concrete, immortal thing. For lack of a better word, the early translators used the word soul. And so soul becomes almost like an obscene word in Buddhist circles. Well, actually, it's not an obscene word. It's just a word. 
because the word so when used also implies such a thing. What the Buddha in his great realization saw, experienced directly, is that Sister Sandra Tang does not have anything which is unchanging, immortal, can burn for a million years and still be there, and atta. What Sister Sandra Tang has is anatta. Sister Sandra Tang is existing, but she is always, at every moment, changing, 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 changing. No concrete self. No nothing that Sister Sandra can say, this is me. So uh, let me illustrate. Is this Dr. Puna? But this body is not Dr. Puna because by tomorrow when I wake up, millions of cells will have died and millions of cells will have come about. So if this is my body, if this is my eternal unchanging self, that should not happen. If you look at my younger photos and the organizers here have very nicely asked for a lot of my photos and they've been playing with the photos, you will see some very young pictures of me that don't even look remotely like me. Is that person Dr. Puna? Or is this one now in front of you on the TV or monitor Dr. Puna? Both are not because even this one will change. A year from now, especially at this age, we will age very rapidly. You will see that I would have changed completely. I had hair. Now I got no hair. See, so shiny. So is it the one with hair that is Dr. Puna or the one with no hair that is Dr. Puna? All of them are Dr. Puna, except he is changing. All the five things, the body, the four aspects of your mind, nothing is permanent. It is always evolving, evolving, evolving. Your consciousness only comes into being when it is conscious of something. Your body is not yourself because your body is always changing. Now, this is not what the Buddha said. This is science. Any physicist can tell you the exact same thing. So you exist, Sister Sandra, but you are always changing. Just like what is surrounding you is always changing, you are also always changing. And that is why, Sister Sandra, you can evolve, you can change to be a Sotapan, a Satangagami, an anagami, an arahan, and even a Buddha. If you've got something unchanging, permanent, eternal in you, then sorry, La Sandra Tang, you will always be Sandra Tang. You will never be an arahan or a Buddha. But because you are always changing, whether from this life to the next, remember what the Buddha taught, you are born of your karma. From this, when you die, another being arises. That being is not the same as you, but that being came into be because of you. So it is also not completely different from you. So to truly understand sunyata, anatta, requires that you really, really reflect. To understand sunyata very well, look at the Heart Sutra. I've given a talk on the Heart Sutra. It's on the internet. You can just look at it in YouTube. It's a two-hour talk and you will hopefully understand a little bit more about emptiness. Thank you.